So uh, first off, uh, I want to thank Nancy Mace for coming here today. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I told uh, Olivia and you all, this is what our school does every election. So last year, okay. four Charleston mayoral candidates because it was the initial election. We had Jim Whitley come to talk about my pleasant. Next year, it'll be you know Will Haney, whoever he's running against. But this year, we've had the Green Party, the Democrats, uh, you know, political scientists, leading yeah. voters. You, thankfully, and then we have a libertarian coming okay. um, in two weeks. And so we believe that our kids will benefit from civics education where they think about the fall needs, go research my candidates, yeah. do it people myself, just because Uncle Bob says that Democrats are this or Aunt Sally says Republicans are that, yeah. we'll go here for ourselves. So we appreciate you sharing your time and maybe talk a little bit about you and your, you know, your platform and things you believe in. And then the kids will have some home and hear questions for you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna turn the uh okay. read it and get uh, it totally right. Probably like uh presenting probably like 20, 25 minutes. Oh, okay. we got yeah, time. yeah. And then questions uh, as long as you'd like. Right. But thank you for being here. No, thank you for having me. Good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon, Good afternoon guys. Hello. I'm so excited. I have um, heard stories over the years of, of you all being very politically astute and politically involved. I've heard about students that have that gone out and door knocked with candidates or made phone calls or been involved in, in campaigns. And so, as a mom, I have two kids that are in middle school right now, and I've seen the efforts that, that the University School of the Country does to get y'all involved in a very young age is impressive. And I'm very impressed uh, with the program that y'all have here, and it's exciting, regardless of whichever way you lean or where your family leans. It's pretty remarkable. It's very special, and it's unique. Not many kids or students have the opportunity to be as involved as you all are. Um, you're very lucky. Um, well, thank you for being here today. Um, never thought that I would be a Republican nominee for Congress in my hometown. Um, I grew up here. I'm from Goose Creek. And um, when I was 17, I was a junior in high school. I had just turned 17, but I, I, I was halfway through my junior year in high school and I, and I quit. I dropped out. And I had some big struggles growing up as a teenager, and I quit on life. I quit on myself, I quit on school, I quit on my family. And my parents, my dad was in the army, and my mom was a teacher. She actually taught at my high school, which is even more embarrassing when you mom out of school and your mom is a teacher at your school. Um, but uh, they said, if you're going to stop going to school, then you have to start going to work. And you know how much jobs yet? I mean, are you saying by doing jobs yet? Are working while that's school yet? Well, one of my first jobs when I was in high school was as a waitress. I waited tables at a restaurant called the Waffle House. Does anybody know the Waffle House? Okay, so you know that you go to the Waffle House, the, the waiters and waitresses, they stand on a piece of duct tape about 12 inches wide, and they yell at the cooks how they want their hash rooms. Smothered, covered, and shunned. Has anybody had that before? Yeah. So I, that was one of my first jobs. I had many jobs as a teenager growing up, and I learned during some really tough times in my life where I struggled, I learned some very tough lessons. And I learned that you quit school and then you had to work <laughs> to pay your bills, especially if you want to live at home with mom and dad. And I did that for a time, and that was in 1995, long before any of y'all were born. Um, and a year later um, was when the Citadel decided that they would let me in. So in the meantime, the principal of my high school, he let me take college courses at Tri Technical College, and I took college courses to finish up my high school diploma. And in 1995, six months after I dropped out of school, I found myself at Stratford High School in New Street in the doorway, with the principal of my high school handing me my high school diploma. Now, usually when you graduate from high school, you go know, with a big speech, you have someone uh, giving a big speech, your families are there with a big crowd, and wearing a cap or a gown. Um, pomp and circumstance is what we call it, that big fanfare. I didn't have any of that. I shook my principal's hands. There were no speeches. My parents weren't even there. And I've never been back to Stratford High School since. This was a deeply tough time for me in my life. And I got my diploma, and a year later, in 1996, the Citadel decided that they would let women in. 
Now, the Daughter of Justice with Bader Ginsburg. Y'all heard about her for passing last week? Well, in 1996, she had a Supreme Court decision that decided that if your school, your college, or your university was funded by government money, that she could not discriminate based on gender. So schools like VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, or the Citadel and others like them across the country had to let women go to school there. And it's crazy to think that this was in 1996, 20, 30, 24 years ago. Just 24 years ago, they didn't have to go to military colleges like the Citadel or VMI. And so my dad is a graduate of the Citadel. Does anyone have a mom or a dad who graduated from the Citadel? Anybody? Two. So my dad went, and I wanted to follow my dad's footsteps. And I didn't go there to be the first woman to graduate from there. I graduated 21 years ago as the first woman to do so. But I went there because I had something to prove to myself. How many times do you want to prove mom and dad wrong? Anybody? All the time, right? And, and can y'all tell me what an 18 year old knows? When you're 18, even now, what do you think they know? They think they know everything, right? I was 18 once and thought I knew everything, and I thought, oh, I'm going to go to the Citadel, I'm going to prove my parents wrong. But as I'm going to prove to myself, I wanted to prove to myself, I wanted to prove to my parents, to my mom and my dad, and my family that I could go to a place that was really hard, that I could face a challenge, face obstacles, face adversity, unlike anything I had ever done before in my life, that I could face an enormous challenge that nobody else had faced before and that I would not quit, that I would not give up. Not on myself, not on my family, not on my friends, not on my classmates, not on anyone. And that is the only reason why I went to the Citadel. I struggled as a teenager, and I had something to prove to myself that I could go somewhere and be challenged, and I wouldn't give up. And I learned a couple of things while I was there. I learned about having courage. Who can tell me what courage is? What's courage? Yes, sir. Yep. What's courage? How would you describe courage? Bravery, continuing on. How would you describe courage? Yes, sir. Perseverance is good. Anybody else? Anybody over here? Courage? Courage for me? Yes, sir. Determination? Great. For me, having courage, too. All of those are the exact right answer. But having courage for me was also learning to speak up. Speak up for myself, but to speak up for other people when something was wrong. And to not be afraid to speak up, to not be afraid of the consequences. If something was wrong, I wanted to learn that I could raise my hand and I could tell the right person that something was wrong. And by doing so, by raising my hand and speaking up, I was doing something good for, for other people. That I wouldn't be afraid to use my voice to speak about what might be wrong that I could make right. And so for me, it was giving a voice to the voiceless, giving people that passion and that, that courage to speak out. One of the other things that I learned while I was at the Citadel was about having confidence. Who can tell me what confidence? What's confidence? Anyone? Yes, sir. Not wondering, not caring what other people are thinking. How would you, how would you describe confidence? Believing in yourself. That's right. Both of those are the right answer. Believing in yourself. I wanted to learn, I learned about having confidence because if you don't believe in yourself, then nobody's going to believe in you. And that might be right when you're doing a group project, a school, building a group project, work together. You gotta be confident in your idea. You gotta be confident to raise your hand in class and ask a question. Or you gotta be confident to raise your hand in class or in a group setting and come up with an answer. Um, having that confidence helps you when you graduate from school and you go to work, when you have a job, or as a mom, a single mom with two kids, 
And as parents, as mom and dads, we've got to have confidence to make sure that you know, we help you all do what you need to do to be successful in school or in your stores or whatever it is that you're doing. And that confidence helped me become the mother that I am today, a single mom, as two kids, one's in sixth grade and one's in eighth grade. To say that is a challenge, especially during COVID right now, would be an understatement. It's extremely hard for the single moms and dads and every working family out there today. It gave me the confidence to be in business. I've been in a business home for 21 years. I have experience starting my own businesses over the years. And it also gave me the confidence to one day run for office, run and win, because I believed in myself. Very first time I ran for office in 2014, I ran for the United States Senate. I was about 35. And when I look back at my campaign uh, and how I had failed big time, I looked at it as I did not have the confidence at the time to run and win. And I said, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> a few years later, in 2017, um, my state house rep, State South Carolina State House of Representatives, um, that person had resigned from office. And in South Carolina, when you resign in the middle of your term in the State House of Representatives, it's to your term, just like the United States Congress, you have eight to ten weeks because it's a special election, which is not the normal election time of year. You have eight to ten weeks to run for office. I said, I can do anything for, for two months, we can do it. I raised $100,000 in about two weeks, two, two and a half weeks for that election, is all I needed to, to win. And I had a special primary election for Republican nomination. I missed winning it outright by 12 votes or so. And I had a special Republican primary runoff two weeks later because in the state of South Carolina, we have a Democrat or Republican primary. If you don't win it by 50% plus one single vote, you have a total runoff two weeks later. And then I had a special general election and I won that one. Ten months later, I had my re-election, and that was in November of 2018. And I'm very passionate about politics. I love what I'm doing in the State House of Representatives. I'm a Republican. I'm known to be what they call a fiscal conservative. Um, I've won awards for trying to cut taxes here in the state of South Carolina for being uh, pro business and a business woman. I want to do things that help businesses grow. I want to help businesses create jobs. I think that's really important, especially now when people are out of work. Um, and also, as a mom, I know that a lot of families are facing issues with getting health care. And health care insurance has been a real big issue for me at the state house level, things that I've worked on. And then, as you all know, when you're driving to and from school, we have a lot of traffic here in Charleston and Mount Pleasant. Lots of traffic. And because we live close to the beach, we live on marshes, and there's a lot of salt in our air and our sea, the cost to maintain and build our roads and bridges in town are is extremely more expensive than anywhere else in the state. So working on our roads and bridges has been a really big issue. Um, two years ago, do y'all remember the Wando Bridge breaking down? Like two years ago. Um, when that bridge broke down in Mount Pleasant, the entire city shut down. That was in my state house district. And I really learned about working with our Department of Transportation at the federal and state level to get the money and resources that we need to build the roads and bridges here. And so I love what I'm doing right now. I don't want to stop. So why would I run for Congress? So two years ago, when I won my re-election, one of my children loves politics and loves to knock on doors and write letters and put bumper stickers and envelopes loves to campaign, and she turned to me one day, the day after the election, and asked why we weren't running against her anymore. Who's a very nice person. I just disagree with a lot of his politics. And so, um, about a year and a half ago, that same child came to me one day, and she said, Mommy, I'm, I, I, I'm Christian, you should take me to church. And we hadn't been to church for a really long time, but this we went in that weekend for the first time in a very long time. It was about being at a crossroads, being at a crossroads in life and trying to make good decisions. Because my life has been a series of, of really second chances. I have failed just as much as I have succeeded in life. And every time I've fallen down, I've tried to pick myself up, back up again, and work hard to be successful. And that's, that's as a student when I was growing up, I wasn't perfect. 
that's as a mom of my kids, I'm not perfect today, I'm not the perfect mom in either of y'all make mistakes. It's important to learn from them and make the right decisions so you can move forward in a positive way. And I love the little country. I grew up here, I work here, I'm raising my two kids here. And because I had 70 second chances in life right here in the low country, and I'm so passionate about those opportunities, I want to do more for more people. I want to give back as much as I can to the community that's given me so many opportunities. And half of what you do as a state lawmaker, even when you're in the U.S. Congress, half of what you do is legislative or policy. You draft bills, you file bills, you vote on bills. You make bills, well, you, you pass those into the Senate chamber, and they pass out of the House and the Senate. At the federal level, same at the state level, they go to the government with the president for state attorney to sign the law. And even though I am a Republican, I go on a lot of issues that are important to Democrats, too. Um, have y'all heard about George, George Floyd before? And everything that's going on, right? Um, one of the issues that I've worked on that's really important to me here in the low country is on criminal justice reform and prison reform. And these are issues that traditional Republicans don't work on. Um, and just about, I don't know, four months ago or so, the governor of South Carolina was able to pass a prison reform bill out of not only the, the state house, but the state senate. And it, it passed unanimously and ended up on the governor's desk to sign this law. And when I say it passed unanimously, unanimously, that means that every single Republican and every single Democrat in the House that voted for it voted for it. Not a single person voted against it. And up until four months ago, part of what this bill did is that in the state of South Carolina, South Carolina's prison system was allowed to shackle or restrain women who were pregnant and having babies so they were in labor and delivery. Does that sound like a good thing to do? It's an awful idea. It's a terrible idea, and we banned it in the state of South Carolina with my bill. The other thing that we did with that bill is we allowed kids whose moms are in South Carolina's prisons to be able to visit them every single week that they're in prison. So when I'm talking about businesses or, in, or employment or criminal justice reform or prison reform, as a Republican, as someone who's been in business who's seen a lot of these issues over the years in the little country, one of the things that I want people to do is I want to give them incentive, give them a reason to be behaving productive members of society. And if moms can see their children every week when they're in prison, then they're going to be better off for it. And they when they get out, they work hard to ensure they don't come back so they can see their kids not just once a week, but every single day. And so these are issues that I'm really, really passionate about. One of the other issues I'm passionate about is about our environment. I'm a conservationist. I've been my entire life. Um, does anybody compost at home? Anybody? All right. I make dirt at home with my kids, too. We put our scraps in a white bucket and we put it in a pile in the backyard. And we then use that dirt to uh, grow vegetables in our garden and have a small garden in the backyard. And I just reseeded part of my lawn and I used some of that beautiful dirt. Um, on how my grass seeds that I had to receive. Um, I recycle, is anybody recycle? Right, that's really important, recycling. Um, and then the other thing uh, that's really important is on this issue with the offshore milling. So, as I say, I was sworn into office on January 23rd, 2018. And literally on my, it wasn't my first week, but my second week in the chamber where we vote on bills was like my fourth day in the chamber. And the very first bill I filed, did anyone guess it was? Anybody? Yes. It was a it was a ban on offshore drilling. My very first bill I ever filed as a state lawmaker was against offshore drilling. And the very first rally I ever spoke at, the very first big event I spoke at as a state lawmaker was against offshore drilling. Um, I've been at anti-seismic testing events with uh, Congressman Joe Cunningham because I'm against that too. And so this is an issue where Republicans and Democrats, at least along the coast of South Carolina, are on board with and together on. And just two weeks ago, I was in Florida with the President of the United States because he banned drilling. Does anybody know for how long? How long? Ten years. The President just banned drilling off of South Carolina's coast, Georgia's coast, and Florida. 
for the next 10 years. The president knows how hard they worked on this issue and how important it is to South Carolina's communities, especially along the coast. Um, and so that's a really important issue, something I'm really proud of the work that I've done. But one of the other things previous to the president banning drilling for the next two years is that the state of South Carolina, every year we go on a budget, and every year within that budget there is a paragraph in the budget that states that the state will not spend any government money on what is called inland infrastructure that is related to offshore drilling. So if they were to drill off the coast, and they're not going to, because there's really not any oil out there, but if for some reason they were going to be doing it, um, the state would not spend any money on it to bring it here to South Carolina. So basically, it's an annual ban in the budget every year uh, that the state does. And that's something the governor supports, and that's something that the Republicans and Democrats and the Senate and the House have supported every year for the last few years. And so um, now that we've been at the federal level, but I want folks to be also been doing at the state level. It's really, really important. Um, something else about this election this year, uh, I have my first debate with Congressman Cunningham on Monday night. At 7 p.m. So if y'all want to see the debates and the issues that we're going to be tackling, you guys can watch. It'll be on SCE TV at 7 p.m. There will be no audience for the COVID-19. Um, there will be no audience there. And uh, I had COVID this summer, and I know how serious the illness is. So I really appreciate everybody that's here today as you're wearing masks at school. And I encourage you to wear a mask when you're out of school. I was really, really sick. Uh, I also went to the hospital in the afternoon because I was too sick, and so we want to make sure that we set a good example. Part of what you learn here is leadership, and leadership is setting a good example. And when you wear your mask and you're not in school, you're setting a good example for your friends and neighbors and folks in the community about how we want to protect each other and be safe and not spread COVID. So I appreciate you doing that today and setting an example for everybody that's here in school, and even when you're not, it's just great leadership. Um, and with that, I guess I will uh, I'll take some questions. Um, my website, if you guys want to check out some of the things that I've written about, um, the issue lines is Nancy Mace, M A C E dot O R G. And um, you can read about different policy positions that I've taken, um, issues that are important. So, with that, I'd love to take some questions. You want to go? Great question. So the question is that I say I'm for lowering taxes, and that there are a lot of TV ads that say that I want to raise taxes. Has anyone seen the TV ads that are running right now? Are you guys seeing them on YouTube? Yeah, uh, my kids. I have, yeah, my kids have seen them on YouTube too. So one of the things that I think is really that I don't like about politics that I hate, or a lot of the things that that uh, groups lie about people's records. And so, uh, one of the ads last week I saw this that I wanted arsenic in the water. Well, no, I don't really need arsenic in the water, it's a poison, and you could die if you drink arsenic. So, not sure. I also don't want to raise taxes. Um, that TV ad said I want to raise taxes by 23%, and that is a tactic that uh, national Democrats are taking against a lot of Republicans this year. Um, I have a 100% record of lowering taxes. And in 2019, I earned the South Carolina Taxpayer Hero Award because of my uh, votes to lower taxes. I've also pledged never to raise any taxes when I'm elected to Congress. I think that's a really important um, thing. A few years ago, the president uh, lowered taxes for all of America. And when he did that, our unemployment rate went big, way, way down. And in Charleston, this is before COVID happened, but in Charleston, in our employment market, the unemployment rate here was 1.86%. And the average unemployment across the country was about 3% of the time. And so not only did, did Charleston have one of the lowest unemployment rates in South Carolina, but we had one of the lowest unemployment rates in the entire country. And so when we lower taxes, government, businesses invest. And their employees, they pay them more. Um, they invest in their businesses. 
And I talked to a lot of folks that own businesses here in Charleston. And I had a friend that owned a fast food restaurant. And they were paying their entry level employees $15 an hour. Now, mind you, minimum wage is about what? Eight percent. So they were paying their entry level employees um, like $15 an hour, and they were about to get a raise to 20 Because the market was so good here. And the market is the best for women, for Hispanics, for African Americans. We had a really, really good job market. But one of the issues that we have down here is education. Because we have a lot of poor communities that don't get access to quality education. I'm going on. There are other questions. We'll go in the orange. Yes, sir. So on a scale of one is in how would I rate Clinton's close ups and Clinton Washington? Oh, how good was my interview? I've done at least eight or more interviews with Clinton Washington. Um, I don't watch myself when I do interviews. <laughs> I think I did a pretty good job. Uh, I, I love Clinton and was really upset when he got attacked the other day in downtown Charleston. Um, I've known him for a really long time, and we don't always agree on things politically, but he does a really good job of doing his research and then asking really tough questions. And so I love doing interviews with Clinton. It's good practice for me and, and understanding and thinking about where do I stand on an issue, how would I answer it, what do I think about it. And um, I think he's a really, he's a great journalist right here in Charleston. Yes. The what? No. No hazing, I was never physically hazed, I was harassed. Uh, sexual harassment, harassment for sure. Um, it was one of the toughest things I've ever done. There was even a bomb threat on my graduation day. And so I had to come through with bomb sniffing dogs. Um, I had threats on my life. My parents had threats on their life too. It was one of the toughest things I have ever done. And I believe that experience has prepared me for Congress because Congress is not easy. It's not easy to say no to members of your own party. Um, I can't speak for the party in general. I haven't read the autopsy report. I would agree uh, with some of the statements that Republicans have issues with certain uh, parts of the community. I, I would love to see more women run for office for the reasons that I stood up, stepped up to raise my hand to run for office because if I don't set an example for women to run, then, then fewer women are going to run. It's incredibly hard when you're a mom and you work and you have kids and all these responsibilities and then say, oh, I'm going to also run for office. It's not, it's not easy at all. You have to make some tough decisions that one of the ways we can do that is by just setting a good example. Um, for me as a Republican, I, I, <laughs> I go against my party a lot. I say that to my party because I am extremely concerned. I do think that regardless of whether or not you're a Democrat or Republican, I think most people are physically conservative or believe they are. So I'm really focused on economic issues as a state lawmaker. But one of the other things, because I grew up here and I've seen the difference between rich and poor is literally black and white in similar communities. So I've worked on things like things that Republicans don't work on and want to avoid. Things like criminal justice reform, things like prison reform. I just toured a nonprofit called Turning Leaf. And Turning Leaf is in North Charleston, and they rehabilitate violent offenders. They don't take anybody less than that. They've been open for five years. It costs ten thousand dollars for four months in that program. Not the same as it costs to be in prison. That's what it costs to stay in South Carolina every every uh, four months, about ten grand. And what they do is they give these uh, violent offenders intense group therapy. 
they give them a job still. When they graduate from the program for months later, they get a job. And so um, advocating and championing those kinds of issues that are not traditional to the Republican Party is something that I've done year after year, because I think it's important that sometimes you don't follow the rules, rules you can break them. And going out there and being on a limb, I've advocated for women, especially for victims of rape and incest and domestic violence. I've tried to lead on a lot of these issues, especially social issues, because I believe they're really important. And if we don't lead on them, then we are going to lose in the future. We need strong women to stand up and have their voices heard. We do that by running for office. And I did question it. Yes, sir. I didn't hear a statement on that. Um, it is what it is, um, so I don't know the context of it. Um, I would, 200,000 people have passed away from this virus. Um, it's a serious illness, and I, and I will tell you, I've taken it very seriously. There's got to be a balance between keeping those who are most vulnerable, letting them you know, be at home, and giving them the resources that they need, those who are especially older or have an underlying health condition, and you've got to balance it with jobs in the economy, if you're healthy, you can go to work, be able to go to work. But when I had it, I'm 42, I eat organic food, I exercise, and I was on my couch for 12 to 14 days, I could not get up. And I had one afternoon where my blood oxygen level was about 87. It's not supposed to be below 90. And my doctor almost sent me to the hospital because it was fluctuating up and down, it finally got up above 90. And I was in a safe zone and didn't have to go, but I almost went to the hospital. I gave COVID-19 to one of my children. The other child did not get it. And we, when I got it, I wanted to make sure that people knew how serious it is. Um, but the thing I want to, the distinction I want to make is let's not forget, it's just not in the United States. It is all around the world right now. And it is something that is affecting every, nearly every country on our planet. And so we've got to make sure that we take it seriously and that we encourage everybody, leading by example, wearing our masks, washing our hands, staying six feet apart. I'm three months post-COVID. I would describe my recovery as what they call a long hauler. I've had a long recovery. Um, and, and it's probably been about seven days because I had to take an afternoon nap, but I spent my summer doing afternoon naps because I was so tired. So um, I would just encourage everyone to take it very seriously. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you want to do that now? Okay. Okay. Amelia? Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this is weird because, like, I see myself on the screen and I see the back of you looking at me, and it's so weird. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being on. Oh, no problem. Uh, so, my question is um, you said you advocate for the environment a lot. If you were elected to office, what would you do for the environment, specifically the loss of our endangered species and our predators, our natural predators, and just what would you do to help our environment? All right, that's a great question and it's really important. Thank you for asking it. Um, I am a conservationist, I'm an environmentalist. I, um, I have 100% lifetime voting scorecard or voting record with the uh, conservation voters of South Carolina, which again is higher than most Democrats. Um, I grew up being in the outdoors. Um, the first time I ever went hunting with my dad, I was five. And I learned about conservation, the protection of our wildlife and our environment, and everything around us. And so whatever we can do legislatively to protect our wildlife, I am always going to be a hundred percent for. And on the Republican side, I think that's something that they're sometimes behind on and would be something I would want to, to, to lead on in the future. Um, I try to lead on a lot of these issues at the state level, and I would just continue to do it at the federal level. All right, I have a good Yes, ma'am. Do I think what do Do 
Do I think women are seen through a different lens when I'm running for office? And the answer is a hundred percent yes. The standards are different. Uh, I think for men and women having I've been breaking barriers all my life. I was the first one to graduate from Citadel, and I saw how differently that women can be treated. Um, I've been in the business world for a long time. The last six years, I've been in commercial real estate, and mostly in commercial real estate, it's all men, just about, with a handful of women. I've seen it there, too. One of the other things that is equally important that I want all of the young ladies to hear today is that sometimes we have this, I don't know if you call it mean rules, that we do this to each other. So young women uh, pick on other young women. And so we sometimes bring each other down rather than bring, building each other back up. And it's really important as you get older that you see that and understand that. I know when I was a cadet at the Citadel, I remember one time, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes you go after your own vets, especially when they're fresh or whatever, and I remember being tougher on the women than I was on the men. And so it goes both ways. I think that women, we can be much tougher and meaner to other women, and maybe we're jealous, and maybe we're insecure, maybe we're not confident. And so then we get we're mean to each other. And instead, you've got to change this. Your generation has to change it, where you treat everybody equally, and you try to bring them enough, support them, because I've seen in corporate America, I've seen in politics, that we are much tougher on each other also. And I learned that when I was in college. And then my first boss on my first job was a woman. And she treated us differently than men too. So that's another important thing to recognize. But it is, it is, it is different man and woman in the way that we campaign, in the way people look at you. Um, you know, I'm a mother and I have two kids. And, and so it's just a different dynamic and you get asked questions like, one of the things that I get asked a lot is how can I be a mom and run for office? Does anybody have a mom that works? You got a working mom? They can do it all, right? Right, you can do it all. You can be a mom and you can work, like, like a lot of moms. So um, it's just, it is definitely different. Great question. You get that other screen? Okay. Oakley, are you there? Do you have a question, Oakley? There we go. All right. Um, thank you for coming. My question was, how do you feel about term limits in Congress? I love term limits. I uh, love well, the idea of term limits, but I'll be honest with you, it's never going to happen. As long as politicians are in power, they're never going to vote to end that power. Um, I have voted uh, and sponsored legislation that would term limit politicians. One of the things that I think we could do that would be easier to get done is if you term limited it in addition, I would probably try this first, but would be to term limit the length of time someone can be a chairman of a committee. And so if you can lengthen that, that time that someone's a chairman, and you're reducing the length of time that that person's in power. And the more that you can turn over the, uh, someone being in power, the more, the more, um, more ideas, the better legislation is. And that is a way to, to semi compromise and turn with people. The other thing you have to think about too is it's not just the politicians, it's also the staff. Because oftentimes when you see a bill filed, that actually politician never actually wrote it. But they had somebody on staff that wrote it for them, and those people are, are there a long time too. So it's a little more complicated, but I think if you can start with, I think it's totally doable by the term limiting chairmanships, that is, would be enormous progress um, for that term limit movement. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. After being infected with COVID-19, do I think masks should be mandatory? Like, like the government telling you what to wear? Uh, I don't, actually. Um, I trust the citizens of South Carolina and when the governor asked us to start wearing a mask in our cases in the, in the early part of June, we were having about 250 cases a day, very low rates statewide. 
by June 17th or 18th, we were at a thousand or higher. And there was a real big push um, to spark the governor to, to wear masks. Um, I personally would rather lead by example and, and have folks be encouraged to do the right thing so the governor doesn't have to tell you. The other thing that I believe in is, is something called home rule. And so the government closest to the people is a government that, that, that does best. And so there are pockets, so take for instance, Charleston County. When South Carolina was a hot spot this summer, there were certain areas, certain counties of Richland County, Columbia, metropolitan areas of Charleston County where you have huge spikes. And I think at that point, uh, those entities that have a home rule obligation can make those decisions in an emergency, and something like that is happening. But by and large, you have a blanket federal mandate that everybody wear masks. It doesn't make sense if you live in a rural area and don't have a huge outbreak of COVID-19. So in areas where that have hot spots, and I think you can't take measures to get a home rule, and South Carolina has that law. And they've been very effective with it. And we're no longer a hot spot. Um, we're doing a really good job, which is why as a, as a state lawmaker, um, and I know it's controversial with Republicans sometimes, but I wear my mask and I talk about wearing it, and I talk about how sick I was, because I almost went to the hospital. And so if you, you know somebody, you know, it's not just somebody like if someone knows someone who's sick or who has passed away from COVID-19, I think that people start to take it seriously. So I've been very, very vocal, even when I've been criticized for it about what we need to do to make sure I don't shake hands, I get double thumbs. Um, because again, that would be very safe and set a good example. Not what leaders do, they lead by example. Yes, sir. So, Nate is being on a charge run for office. A disadvantage? Um, great question. Uh, I was talking about this with a friend today, being a single mom with two kids in middle school. Is that a disadvantage? It certainly makes it tougher, but I will tell you with, if you work hard, you have a goal and you're passionate about it and you love what you're doing. And I love the low country, I love what I'm doing as a state lawmaker. There, there's nothing that you can't do. When you love it, it doesn't feel like work. And um, to that end, when I had my, my Republican primary in June, that was right off the heels of us shutting everything down with COVID. My kids hadn't been to school in two or three months and had to be homeschooled. I broke every fundraising record. I won my primary, four-person primary, by over, by over 30 points, by 31 points, I had no runoff. And since that time, I've broken every fundraising record for anybody in Congress ever in the history of South Carolina. And so, um, you know, if you're passionate and you love it, we'll figure out how to make it work. But some people may do a good scenario, but for me, I feel like being a single mom with two kids in middle school gives me a greater advantage because I know what working families are facing right now. It's really hard. My kids are not able to go back to school or their homeschool. And so when we're making these decisions about how we educate our kids, I'm actually right in the thick of it and I'm doing it and understand the issue I feel like better than someone who doesn't. Yes, ma'am. Looking at Looking forward, where the hopes are for my job. Well, I'm running for office to do something, not be someone. Um, as you see right now, if you watch to see how violent and negative things are and divided we are as a country, decades ago when we were in Congress, we actually reached across the aisle to work with people to get things done. It was peaceful done. We could sit at a table and negotiate a deal and compromise and not scream at each other. And we need people who are going to be truly bipartisan in their efforts. And I have a strong record of being bipartisan and working together with Democrats and issues important to everybody. And so um, it could be on jobs, it could be on infrastructure, offshore, whatever you name it, but having someone who can be a truly independent voice. And any sign that I've spoken out or spoken out against other politicians, it's usually members of my own party. And so it's really important to have someone I believe that will stand up, no matter the consequences, because it's their way to do it. And it goes back to having courage and confidence that I don't care what the repercussions are, I'm going to do the right thing, my constituents every time. 
I made a lot of, and in the newspaper a lot about advocating for issues, whether that's for women, whether that's for prison reform, that are not in line with my party, because I just lose the show about making the, the country a better place. That's really what it's about. And the other thing I want to say is half of what you do is legislative and write bills and pass laws. But the other half of what you do as a member of Congress or as a state lawmaker is you help your constituents. Right? Somebody has a need. Well, last summer I had somebody call me and had breast cancer. And they were being denied their health insurance coverage for the surgery that they needed because they hadn't had a genetic breast cancer test before they got diagnosed. I don't, it's called a rocket test. I don't, never had it before we get it. Never heard of it before. And I told the person who called me, I said, I can't make any promises. But let me make a phone call because I knew someone at the insurance agency was going to call them and beg them for help. I called the insurance agency, and three hours later, they called me back and said that their medical team would review the file, re review the file. They were going to cover her cancer surgery in 100%. And that one day, that one phone call, that is my greatest accomplishment at any point as a state woman. That young lady is alive today. We got her the treatment that she needed. We got the church to cover 100%. And that really is all that matters. I just want to help those that need it most. Yes. Right. I'm wearing masks to produce hotspots. It certainly would, and that's why the local government in times of an emergency, like the city of Charles or the town of Mount Pleasant, as a town or a city, they have the ability to make those decisions as they're happening. But in places where it's rural or you live on a farm, it just, it's just a different standard. You're not, they're not at as great a risk. Um, and if you're able and you stay home, you should, all those things. But that's why we have some help in the world where local entities can help make that decision when we are spiking. But because folks have been pushing masks and masks and masks, South Carolina has done a really good job of how a statewide mask mandate of, of bringing in the spread of it. This is a highly contagious disease. When I got it, I was wearing my mask and I was out and out. And we have no idea where I got it because no one told me that. They exposed me to it. And I was around 18 people that week and, and until I got tested, and nobody got it. And not even anybody that was working at my house because my house was on my campaign and no one on my campaign got it miraculously. One on his side, and the other one did not. And so um, we've got to do everything we can set a good example. But that's what I think was there for, especially if you want to see how make those decisions. Yes, ma'am. So, who are and also um, about COVID coming through my system. How do you focus all of that when you have COVID? You are a still working parent, you have your children, how do you focus all that and still have your life that you Okay, so I'm a single mom and I'm a working mom and I'm a state legislator and I'm Congress and I got COVID this summer. Question, how did I cope with all of that? Uh, it's a lot, I gotta tell you, but I love, love that you're doing have passion for it, it doesn't matter whether you blow it, whether it's whether a class or an activity or a sport or a job, when you love what you do, it does not feel like work. And for me, I work so, so hard, especially the things that I love. Um, but when I got COVID, I was so far ahead of where I needed to be at that juncture in my campaign. It didn't affect the campaign really at all. My campaign at that point, we were primary and we needed to get an office headquarters anyway, so it was a good time to get out of Nancy's house and go get a real office, so we did that. Um, but just by working really hard, and we we are Sean and ever, we've done an incredible job campaigning, um, nothing ever stopped. And so for me, my kids are number one, so I'm always going to make sure that they're okay, and then my kids are able to, to participate in things. It was hard this summer because we could go to camp, so or anything like that. I really couldn't leave the house and such a bicycle ride or a walk, those kinds of things. It was really difficult. Um, so for me as a mom, my, my job is always to make sure that they're okay and take care of them, and then I can do other things. But because I worked so hard so quickly in the primary and later after when I got COVID, it really didn't impact us at all. I felt that. 
I was sick, I was really, really sick. And I told us about a week ago, I didn't have all my energy back, but um, I always joke that because I'm so high energy that I was, when I was sick, I was operating at 185% instead of 200%. But I always listen to how I feel, and my body said, you take a nap, take a nap. And that way, um, it wasn't as was impacting on my work and my kids. Yes. Okay. Okay. How do you feel about the way America is currently handling the work in many countries? According to many, both you see, we're handling it on the work in many countries. According to you, which, uh, which group? CDC. Oh, CDC. We're handling it the work in many countries. We're not handling the work, but we're still not doing a great job either. Our cases are you see, we hit, we're hitting another increase in corona, too. Mm -hmm. Do you have any input on that? So, uh, so right now, CDC says we're not doing a very good job on our reaction to COVID-19. I do somewhat agree on that. There are, there are things, and if you look at what's going on all around the world, many, many, many countries are facing a second wave right now. So it's not just the United States that's struggling with this right now. There are countries that are starting to lock back down again, or cities that are having hot spots again, and we're seeing some states that live out in the Midwest that are becoming hot spots again. Um, one of the things that I advocated for since the very start of COVID 19 was to get widespread, rapid testing so you could know in 15 minutes whether or not you were positive for COVID 19 or not, and to get those tests in every community so you could get tested and that way you know where the real hot spots are. Up to 50% of people who have COVID-19 have no idea they have it because they don't have any symptoms. So that's one of the things that, um, that I've been working on over the last few months and really trying to push. One of the things that happened at the beginning of COVID-19 is that the government, the federal, state, and local government has a lot of laws and rules and regulations which has hindered or inhibited our ability to respond more quickly to COVID-19. So for example, the governor of South Carolina, almost immediately when COVID started, suspended a law called the Certificate of Need Law. And it limits the number of beds a hospital can have, it limits the number of beds in a nursing home. And that's a, a bill, a law that I drafted that I would love to see removed permanently. So if we have a big crisis or a pandemic, we don't have laws and regulations and rules making their response to the pandemic slower. Are we out of time? Okay. Then we'll look at time. We're out of time. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. One more question right over here. Yeah. What is it like actually running for Congress? Um, I'm enjoying it. I love it. I love the work that I do. It's hard work. I have to raise money every single day, which means I call people I don't know and I ask them for a check. Which is kind of nerve wracking. It's you know it's a lot. Um, I have a campaign I have to run and make decisions about what I say and where I say it and what kind of uh, policy I want to have, whether that's COVID nineteen or reopening the economy or how to get people back to work. But I love it. It's seven days a week right now, um, and uh, I'm doing everything I can. I'm an introvert, which makes it a little more. I know I'm an introvert too. I think I'm an introvert. So at the end of the day, after campaigning. If you're out talking all day, you get tired. I get really, I get tired. So I like to go home and rest because I am an introvert, but I love what I'm doing. So it just, it doesn't feel like work. And I've been given so many, you know, my life has been a series of second chances. I've been given so, many, given so much opportunity here to drop out of school at the age of 17, to be a Waffle House waitress, and then be the first one to graduate from the state of now being a, a Republican nominee running for Congress. I mean, that's the American dream. When you fail, you can work hard and succeed. So I love what I'm doing and want to share that with the rest of our community and our country. Thank you all. I appreciate you so much for having me today. Y'all are amazing. And thank you for listening to both sides of the argument. We really appreciate it. Thanks, many thanks to you. And yeah. Olivia has been wonderful about organizing this to make sure this happens exactly what we hope for the chance to do. It was fabulous. It was fantastic.
the kids who brought you in are going to escort you out here a little gift for you and and thank you so much appreciate for being y'all here. love y'all study hard turn all your work in <laughs> thank you all right so ben and violet yep ben how are you yep. babe Will Kester, you want to be part of this? Yes, sir. You want to touch them? We're getting kind of pictures of the outside. Yeah.